It is exciting to be here. Uh, I was telling folks this morning I've been working on climate policy for 25 years, and this Invest in America agenda restored this unfamiliar feeling of hope. Like, we will actually, we can get this done. Uh, it's, it's incredibly exciting. And the other thing that's exciting from a workforce per perspective is that the way we're going to get it done is by creating good union jobs that people want that they want to grow in, that they want to retain over their careers. So I'm really excited to work, or to, to work with and to, to be joined uh, by Austin Kieser, uh, who's an assistant to the, the international president of IBEW. IBEW is the world's largest energy union. What, 820,000 members? Yes. Yeah. And growing Growing rapidly, yeah. in part because of the uh, the commitment of the Biden administration and the labor standards that Congress put into uh, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act. So this is a really, really incredible moment. And I know that there's a lot of uh, employers out there who might be worried, you know, look at this 1.5 million jobs that we're creating and might actually think about that with some trepidation of how are we gonna find the workers to, to, to fill those jobs, to meet the moment. Uh, and it's a race, right? It's a race to the starting line, and then it's a race to, to maintain competitive industries. So I wanted to kick things off with just talking about that, you know, the moment, this big ambition, and how, uh, how we're going to get it done. And specifically, you know, we're trying to combat the climate crisis, address historical injustices, uh, and create broadly shared prosperity, good union jobs, and those, those three things might be seen as you know, hard to do together, or maybe some of you think it could be a barrier to work with organized labor. So I wanted to start, Austin, you could just talk about what is, what's the value proposition? You talk to a lot of employers. Why, why should they work with you? All right, well, first of all, thank you, Bethany, for having me here. And Jigger, we, we just saw backstage. This is a great event. Uh, we're proud to be part of it. It's, uh, I've listened to some of the speakers so far, and there's just so much happening in the industry. And so we're, we constantly try to wrap our heads around everything that's happening, too. And we were, we were very instrumental, I think, and st I think starting where the value proposition is, is the fact that we all came together as a coalition. Labor, you guys in this room, um, and a lot of other stakeholders in the government to bring about these large bills that are creating this historic investment. And so I would, I would start with that. Um, and then I would say the things like prevailing wages, apprenticeship utilization requirements, um, I know it scares people who haven't lived in that space before to think about how their business model fits with what we do at the IBW, which by the way, we've been doing for well over a century. And I'll hedge the entire conversation with, it is not ever in the interest of the IBW or any labor union in this space to be punitive or to disadvantage the contractors and developers who work with the IBW. It is always in our interest to advantage those contractors in the marketplace, whether it's creating, creating the jobs, gobbling up the market share, um, whatever the interest may be, um, we're in it together. Um, we haven't been, I think, you know, National Electrical Contractors Association as our partner in the construction industry, we haven't been on strike um, in a century. We have a great relationship in our industries. We represent over 90% of the investor-owned utilities in the country. Um, you know, we have a tremendous footprint in the energy space, and it is always in our interest to grow the market, but also to make sure that workers get an equitable shake in it. And so you were talking about um, how do we do all these things together at the same time. And um, that's really what's been the holdup. You know, we've seen power plants and traditional generation go offline, as we've seen um, renewables try to penetrate the marketplace, and um, they, haven't been this, they haven't been on par with each other. You know, when a power plant shuts down in a, in a rural community, it is the entire center of that community. And so people have identified the green movement with creating poverty in a lot of communities across the Midwest. And that's, that's a shame, right, because it doesn't have to be that way. And I think what we've done in these bills is trying to it sent a large signal to communities that we're going to invest um, where jobs have been lost or where jobs have been displaced in heavy industry, including coal and natural gas and other, other power generation sectors and in uh, heavy industry that have used fuels um, and coal, you know, coal and other, other fuels in their boilers for um, a century. So when those plants have shut down and they see, say, a solar field come in and have little, very little job growth with very low wages 
not a lot of residual investment, not really the hub of the community like the power plant that shut down was, um, they think that that was the cause of it. And so the political pushback has been tremendous um, for a long time. And I think we all saw that we were up against a, uh, we we're at a cliff really. Without this reinvigoration of the IRA and the infrastructure package, um, the community support for anything green is waning pretty quickly. And I mean, that's why we only see, you know, small, what, you know, small, you know, single digit market penetration in renewables in a lot of the large marketplaces like the PJM marketplace. So we have to figure out how to make, how to solve these problems together. We can't create poverty while making the economy cleaner. We have to do the things together. And we have to include the communities that are being affected by it. We can't create a thousand jobs in San Francisco and tell folks in West Virginia, hey, we created a thousand jobs. That does, doesn't work. It's not, a it's not an argument that can be won politically, and it's been setting us back and progressing. So what this bill does and what this landscape, what these bills do and what this landscape does and what the posture of the current administration does is it brings us all together. And so if you're going to pay prevailing wage, which is, are built into most of these bills or built into grant applications, if you're going to utilize registered apprenticeship programs, which will bring along a workforce, and make sure that we're training new workers as the economy expands in traditional classifications like as an electrician and not a technician, but in something that if they're working on a solar field today, they could go work in a data center tomorrow when that solar field's done. That creates the type of stability in communities that we need, but in that wage, what's built in is those, are those training programs. What's built into that wage is an army of advocates for projects that are gonna utilize um, the workforce that they represent. So if you're, going to, if you're going to sign a project labor agreement in the community, you can guarantee that not just the electricians, but the operating engineers and the laborers and the iron workers and the list goes down the line are going to stand together at hearings, looking at um, issues you may be having with land utilization. Um, all of those sort of things that get in the way, local regulations, local rules. I'm not saying they get in the way for bad reasons, but sometimes they're just they're wonky and they need public input and public support uh, to get you across the line. That's the type of partnerships that we develop with the industries that we work with. And so if, you're gonna, if, there, if the threat or the fear is union workers cost more, well, first of all, I think that's been demoted a million times. I have to give you a million studies that show you know, that wages are a product, are product of productivity and the number of hours it takes to be that productive, right? It's not, it's not a simple, what is the hourly rate versus the hourly rate? That's one, we can debunk that. But second, if you're gonna pay it anyways, why not pay the most trained workforce in the world? Yeah. Why not be a party to that, to that system? Why not um, get what's built into that wage already? Yeah, so let's talk, let's talk about training, but first, just to, just to put a, a, a pin in something that you said, it's really, this administration's focus on job quality that has made workers in your union and others uh, comfortable with supporting or getting behind these policies to support decarbonization and deployment. It's because there's these, these conditions to ensure that this transition isn't gonna lead to more poverty, poverty level jobs that we've seen, you know, the trend in a lot of industries being. So that's, that's really important. I think there is, you know, I hear uh, in my position a lot of concern around, around labor shortages because we're making so many investments, and it not, it's not just the public sector investments, but the leveraged private sector investments, and all of these projects need workers at the same time. And so what is the, what is the solution? What is the, the training path? Just describe your, this system of registered apprenticeship and how it's designed to confront that. Right, it's, well, so that's, our system of training has existed for over a century. Uh, the modern uh, registered apprenticeship program for about the last 70 years. Um, and we were a founder of it. We've been doing it since the beginning of time. So trying to replicate it is really gonna create a large inefficiency in the marketplace, because you can't really do it. It's a direct partnership between the workers and the contractors in an area. And so the boards are made up of equal parts and they're called joint registered apprenticeship programs in our case. And that's the ones we think are the most valuable because they take into account the workers. And I will say we don't train workers for jobs that don't exist. And so just as you rely on market signals and market predictability uh, to make capital investments in your businesses, it's the same way that the apprenticeship program runs. If we don't know that there are going to be jobs 
if we don't have that relationship with developers and with contractors, we can't predict what the workforce needs are for that community. And therefore, we're not going to invest because we, again, don't train workers who do, we don't put into jobs right away. Part of the apprenticeship program is on the job training. It's not just in a classroom setting. Although the classroom setting is very intense, that happens. We have over 300 training facilities in the United States. Every community here is covered. That's just on our construction phase. We have outside construction and transmission. We have uh, tons of apprenticeship programs with individual employers and manufacturing and other spaces. But if we're talking about the construction space, over 300 training facilities, and we're actually expanding that. We're starting breaking ground on new facilities. Obviously, we have new technologies and things like that that allow us not to, to do training without sort of brick and mortar expansions like a lot of schools have and everybody else. Um, but it's outside of the United States military, we are the largest vocational trainer in the entire world. Our programs are larger than most of the university systems in the United States. They are huge, they are well-established, and they were huge, big investments. And they're built like a bladder. <laughs> so we don't need new programs, right? We keep hearing, we need new apprenticeship programs, we need new apprenticeship programs. No, there are apprenticeship programs in every community in this country. They need expanded. And the only way to expand them is to show them market predictability. And for, so I'm gonna give you, we were just in Indianapolis. Um, there is, uh, our training program there takes in usually about 50 apprentices a year into a class, a first year class. There's five years of apprenticeship. In a first year class, about 50 apprentices. This year they took in 170. And so when we hear about the worker shortage problem, what people don't think about is the pipeline of applicants that we have that never make it into the apprenticeship program because there's not that predictability to put them to work. I will promise you, we will take in every single applicant that we can put to work in order of their eligibility to go you know, in, their, in their training program. So we have the ability, there's not a shortage of workers in the construction industry, there's a shortage of predictability and partnerships. And so um, when we're developing a project, we have that. And we also broker labor uh, between jurisdictions. So if there's a boom in one area and a bust in another area, we can move workers temporarily while we take in new apprenticeship program to create that basal rate of employment that's needed over a 30 year career as an electrician. So we create the stability that all of us need for the long-term investments in the, uh, in the marketplace. So if, so if an employer or company wants to establish that partnership with you in order to tap into that trained workforce and in order to make sure that when they need the workers, they're gonna be available, what does that look like? When should, that, when should they reach out to you? When should that happen? What's the timing? What is the agreement? Yeah. Walk us through it. For the answer of everybody in this room, it's now. <laughs> but I mean, it really is. It's at the very beginning conceptual stages of your project. Let's talk about what your, what your concept is. What do you need? Not just in workforce needs, but what do you need to help get your project adopted by the community? Do you have city council ish hurdles? Do you have planning commission hurdles? What do you have? I mean, we have a presence, a brick and mortar presence with, with local unions chartered that cover the entire country that have a tremendous amount of influence and understanding of the local political uh, infrastructure and economy. That's a big piece. But also, if we have that predictability, and you know you're gonna try to put a shovel on the ground in two years, you don't take somebody off the street and create a, a journey level worker out of them tomorrow. There's a training program, so we have to bring them in now, train them, get them ready for your projects. Make sure you have the workforce that you're going to need, not just for the construction phase, but for the operations, the capital improvement phases, and expansions you may have predicting in the future. That is what we do. We look at those local economies and we predict workforce. And we train to that workforce. And we've been very good at it and very efficient at it. But it's got to be early on. And we need your partnership early on. And you're saying that, um, that you can deliver all of those benefits and it doesn't even cost more. It's all built into that wage. <laughs> so if you're, going to go, if you're going to go pay a non-union um, contractors, employees who haven't been trained to the level that we're trained at and don't have that community presence, that same wage with none of that built in, that's probably not the best business decision, to be honest with you. So all you have to do is pay that, pay that prevailing wage to a union contractor and with it comes the complete training program, pensions, healthcare, stability in the marketplace, uh, not overtraining so that it's, not a, it's a, not a fleeting workforce that you're constantly having to start over again every time you have a new capital expenditure. All of these things are built into that one wage.
that one wage. Yeah, it reminds me of talking to this uh, solar company in West Virginia a few years ago, and he said uh, partnering with the IBW was the single best business decision he ever made because he got all of these benefits and his costs actually went down. He didn't need his whole HR team and to manage the benefits and whatnot. And I think and that's Maybe true. We bring no, and we bring. I, you know, I think sometimes it's important to explain. You know, what a guild union is. We take very. Um, we take a ton of pride when you reach that journey level status. We enforce that ourselves. We have stu our union steward on the job. Just doesn't enforce the contract. They enforce the craftsmanship level that we require somebody to be a journey level worker. Because how can we demand a wage that doesn't match the productivity that I, that we just discussed earlier? So we take that upon ourselves, and we have a very structured program called the Code of Excellence um, that we, we enforce ourselves. We reserve the right to discipline our own members for lack of craftsmanship. And when I say discipline, it's usually not discipline. It's usually, the, hey, maybe you need to go back to apprenticeship and get, you know, touch up here a little bit. Or maybe you're not quite a journey level worker yet. Why don't we take you back to the apprenticeship? Or, hey, if there's something going on here, how about you take a break from uh, working in the electrical industry for a little while while we get you some help or whatever, whatever needs to happen. But we do that because we demand a high level of craftsmanship. And that's what our tradition is built off of, that's what our wages are built off of, and that's what our reputation is built off of. And we are taking an immense amount of pride in that. So we want to deliver the best workforce in the world to every construction project in North America. So if you've, if you've applied for DOE funding, either grants or loans, or you're looking at it, you'll already know this, but we have this community benefits plan framework and what it, in, what's it, what it is intended to do is have uh, employers or project proponents think up front about how deep and meaningful engagement with the community, with workers, with labor unions can be supportive of project success, help mitigate some of the risks uh, associated with, with deployment. Can you talk a little bit just to wrap us up here, it looks like, uh, about the risk mitigation oh, yeah. benefits? Mean, well, you know, I'll, I'll start with DEI, local hiring provisions, a skilled workforce, uh, pensions and health care, stable jobs, high wages, all of those things. Um, a simple agreement with us checks every one of those boxes. You don't have to go out and do a bunch of different partnerships. We already exist in those communities. We're already doing all of that work. And simply an agreement with the IBW satisfies almost every checkbox on that list of those community benefits agreements. So I strongly encourage you to, to consider just reaching out to your local union. Um, if you have trouble doing that or you don't know where to start, reach out to us. Um, at the international office, and we'll certainly get you in touch and point you in the right direction. And you, you mentioned DEI, and I guess I just want to add, squeak, squeeze one more question yeah. in here, but I think a lot of people think, well, we can either address the, you know, the racial injustice and the diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, or we can work with labor. And what you're saying is that you have those partnerships, that it's not an either or. Can you just talk a bit about your Yeah, I mean, our, our workforce, and it's, you know, as measured, and we've talked about with the administration and everybody up front, and that's why a lot of these provisions were included, is much more diverse than the non-union contractor basis workforce, much more. And by signing project labor agreements and agreements with us, it automatically diversifies your workforce higher and gives us the opportunity to bring in even more um, diversity to the rank and file of our, of our union membership and put them on your job site. So we are well ahead of the curve on this. For instance, uh, Boston, I believe, um, just recently took in a class of around 1,000 new apprentices, which is an expansion. And I think 70% se of them are either minority or female. So Incredible. we are diversifying at a crazy fast rate. Um, we have partnerships in almost every community to do this. Um, of course, not all communities are very diverse. I mean, Kansas look, you know, some places in Kansas look different than Chicago. Um, but we are uh, ahead of the curve and we are diversifying. Our attrition classes that are retiring and cliffing off um, are mostly white and mostly men. We will never deny that, that's the truth. And, but our classes coming in are dramatically more diverse than the communities that they, that they exist in because we are diversifying quick. And we take a lot of pride in that. We have a program called IBW Strong um, that, is, that we drive at, and our international president drives at hard. It's, it's a very high st of our priorities. Yeah, it's such an yeah. important story. Thanks for, yeah. thanks for sharing that. All right, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it.